today. There we go. That's what I like to hear. Well, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Cooper Peters. I help lead uh, worship in the youth on uh, Wednesday nights. Uh, but Jake and Kalen are on vacation this morning, so you're stuck with me. Sorry about it. But we're going to go ahead and we're going to praise the Lord nonetheless. And uh, why don't y'all just join me in this first song? Y'all might not know this song, but uh, if you kind of figure it out, go ahead and sing out. Even when I was young and my life had just begun, you were calling me your son. Though I made some bad mistakes, I will sing out all your praise, though the whole world knows your name. Even when the sock gets stuck and my days are getting up, I will sing about your love. Oh, your spirit like a dove comes and tells me I'm enough. It's your name I lift up above. I sing out from the highest mountain. Your kingdom come. And when I praise, I praise the Father, Spirit, Son. I'm not there yet. I know y'all probably didn't know that song, but y'all should know this song. It's only been done about a bajillion times. So sing out with this one, and let's just praise the Lord this morning.
Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning, God. We thank you for the ability to just gather in your in your presence, God. Heavenly Father, I beg you to bring your word to us today, God. That you just speak through Pastor Jimmy and that we receive you. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Well, good morning. Welcome to Ridgeline. My name is Shandra Shores, and we are so glad that you are here this morning. We are a pretty busy church, so if you have not yet downloaded the church app to keep up with all the events we've got going on, make sure that you do so right as soon as church is over. So that's all I've got, guys. Go find somebody you don't know and welcome them to church. All right, all right. Well, good morning. Good morning, Ridgeon. Welcome to church. We're so glad that you're here this morning. Excited about what God's doing. My name is Jimmy Davis, lead pastor. And uh, thank you, Cooper, for leading us. But can we give God a round of applause this morning? Yeah. He's awesome. It is exciting to come to the house of the Lord and just to worship him this morning. Um, thank you guys for joining us. i got a few announcements uh, real quick. Just need to talk to you guys uh, about what's going on uh, in the upcoming months. Um, from now till uh, the end of the year, we have three main events at our old property, the 12 acres uh, we call Silo City. And uh, so basically, next Sunday we have an ice cream social. Um, I want to tell you guys that's we have a we're going to have an ice cream judging contest. And so if you uh, are good at making ice cream or not, uh, make your ice cream. It is free to sign up. We just need to know that you're si you're going to join the contest. And there is actually prizes to win. So we got we want you guys to be a part of that. Uh, it costs nothing to sign up. And you get the old ice cream maker out. You can make it that way. You can make it by just throwing a bunch of stuff in a pot and throwing it in the freezer. And uh, who knows, you might, win a, you might win a prize. So that's next Sunday. If you don't want to make ice cream, it's okay. It's okay. Just come on out. We're going to have some extra ice cream anyway. And uh, that's, uh, it's, it's next Sunday at 5 o'clock at, at Silo City in the afternoon. So we want you to be a part of that. We're going to have stuff for the kids to do and the teenagers. We're going to have cornhole and horseshoes for adults. So it's just a time to come out there and just hang out and just be a family. Uh, bring a lawn chair and bring your ice cream and bring an appetite. So we want you guys to be a part of that. Also, Fall Festival is October 12th at 6. That's a little ways away, I know, but I just want to keep it fresh on your mind. Please sign up. Uh, we have it. We have a section to where you just have to work a, a block of that event, so it's like an hour, an hour long uh, block or somewhere in there. But we need everybody to sign up and to serve a little bit. And what that is, it's a festival that we put on, and man, we just as people come, it's such a fun time. It has that authentic feel, but they will absolutely hear the name of Jesus. And so, it, not only is it a fun event, but it's also a great mission work for you to get out and be the hands and feet of Christ. So, sign up, sign your family up, sign your teenagers up. Uh, let's make this thing a successful uh, fall fest this year. That's October 12th, and then November 10th is our gathering down there. That's where we have our Thanksgiving meal. So you can write those dates down. They're on our app, church app calendar. You can look there. The reason I'm telling you about all these dates at the property is because tonight, men, tonight um, from 4 to 6, we're having a stick pickup party. Yeah, so we, uh, we are asking you guys to bring rakes, to bring wheelbarrows, blowers, weed eaters, post hole diggers, uh, drills and impacts, and what we're going to do is all of us men's going to get together, and we're going to kind of clean it up. It's pretty clean, but it just needs a little bit of touch up. Who says men can't clean, right? Anyway, so we're going to we're going to clean some stuff. We have a few holes we need to dig and uh, some poles to set, and we have a, st a puppet stage to erect on this on the main stage, the Woodland Theater. Theater. So uh, what we're asking is four to six men, if you could. And you could break away from your family. Just come on out and just help us do that. It's a, it's a lot of fun. If you never worked with a bunch of men, just like the spontaneous work days, they're super fun. And so we could really, really use your help tonight because we have several events coming up between now and the end of the year. Uh, and we just want to make it look nice and pristine, especially when we have visitors on our campus. So thank you guys for helping us with that. If you can make that, we sure would appreciate that. Uh, like I said, if you don't have any of that equipment, just come on out because we can definitely still use you. All right, so that's uh, just some announcements I got. I wanted to tell you. Hope that's as clear as mud. I know I'm talking fast, but I got a lot of notes today. But before I jump off into my message, you know, school's back in session, and I heard a story of a teacher who was teaching her kiddos world religions, world religions, and she said, "You know what? Uh, I have a lot of diversity in this classroom. So here's what I want to see. I want to see each one of you bring something from your home that reminds you of your religion that you are." And so the very next day, uh, she turned to the first kid, and the first kid stood up, and he said, I'm a Muslim, and he held up this rug, and he said, this is my prayer rug. 
And all the kids looked at it, and they were all pretty amazed. The second kid stood up and said, I'm Jewish, and this is my family's menorah. Third kid stood up and said, hey, I'm Roman Catholic, and he held up a, a necklace and said, this is my mom's rosary. Fourth kid stood up and said, I'm a Greek Orthodox, and he had this little bitty figurine. He said, this is my patron saint. The fifth kid stood up and said, hi, my name's Sally. I'm a Baptist. This is my mom's casserole dish. So anyway, <laughs> we likes to eat. Anyway, so, so here's a question for you today. If you were going to describe from what you know, from just your head knowledge, if you were going to describe King David in one phrase, what would it be? What would it be? We're talking, today I'm going to be talking about, we're going to fast forward a little bit, and we're going to talk about David's kingship and kind of some of the struggles he went through. But if you were going to describe him in one phrase, what would it be? For most of us, it would be that famous quote found in the book of 1 Samuel when Samuel's talking to Saul at the end of his reign. And, and he says this to Saul. He says, for the Lord has sought him a man after his own heart. Matter of fact, it's echoed again in the book of Acts chapter 13 that David was a man after God's own heart. Now, that's a pretty awesome compliment, if you think about it. That's God speaking to Samuel, saying, he's a man after my heart. I would love to be that. that that's, I would love if God called me. Jimmy, that Jimmy, he is a man after my own heart. What, what a great compliment that would be. David, in his time underneath Saul as king, and as his own kingship, he would, he, you may not know this about him, but he was one of the greatest military leaders in history. See, he never lost a military battle. David became a great leader, and then he became an awesome king. And what did he do while he was king? Well, he conquered all of Israel. He brought it underneath one crown. He expanded the borders of the nation. And then he, made it, he brought it to a place to where outside forces wouldn't be a threat for generations to come. But even with all of David's victories and accolades and achievements and even compliments from God... David wasn't perfect. You know, and even though he never lost a military campaign, he did lose a battle. He lost a battle that he fought with another giant. And I'm not talking about one of Goliath's brothers or cousins or even redneck cousin, Big Bubba, you know, none of that. He lost a giant, a battle with a giant from within. We all have these giants within us. What you may not know about David, or you may, if you, if you studied a little bit of him, David obviously had a sweet spot for the ladies. David had seven wives and he had ten concubines. And then that's where the problem lies. Because King David, as being the king, he wasn't supposed to do that. He wasn't, according to the Mosaic law, Moses wrote this in the book of Deuteronomy 17, 17. It says, for the king must not take many wives for himself because they will turn his heart away from the Lord. See, even before Israel had a king, way before, God had already established the rules and regulations and the law of what the king should and shouldn't do. And one of them was he shouldn't have a bunch of wives. See, for God, the design of mankind has always been one man, one woman, becoming one flesh. But in 2 Samuel, we see a story where he has built, David has built this great empire, and all is good. But then, because of his failure to listen and follow God's command, we see David's life take a swift turn and lead to a path of calamity. I'm going to read this morning from 2 Samuel chapter 11, verse 1. I'm going to read part of it, and then I'm going to kind of paraphrase the last of it. So if you want to turn there, 2 Samuel 11, 1. It says this. It says, In the spring, when the kings marched out to war, David sent Joab with his officers and all, and all of Israel, and they destroyed the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah, and David remained in Jerusalem. One evening, David got out from his bed and was strolled around the roof of the palace. From the roof, he saw a woman bathing, a very beautiful woman. So David sent someone to inquire about her, and he reported, This is Bathsheba, daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite. David sent messengers to get her, and when, he, when she came to him, he slept with her. Now, uh, she had been purifying herself for uncleanliness. Afterwards, she returned home. In verse 5, it says, The woman conceived and sent word to inform David, I'm pregnant. David sent orders to Joab, send me Uriah the Hittite. So Joab sent Uriah to David, and when Uriah came to him, David asked, how's Joab, how's the troops doing, and how's the war going this far? Then he said to Uriah, go down to your house, wash your feet. So Uriah left the palace, and, he, and a gift from the king followed him. But Uriah slept at the door of the palace with all the master servants. He did not go down to his house. When it was reported to David 
Uriah didn't go home, David questioned Uriah. Haven't you just come from a journey? Why didn't you go home? And Uriah answered, The ark, Israel, Judah, and are all dwelling in tents. My master Joab and his soldiers are camping in an open field. How can I enter my house, eat and drink, and sleep with my wife? As surely as you live, by your life, I will not do this. Stay here today, David told Uriah, and tomorrow, and I will send you back. So Uriah stayed in Jerusalem for that day and the next. Then David invited Uriah to eat and drink with him. And David got him drunk, and he went out to the evening and lie down in a cot with his master's servants, but he did not go home. So the story goes on. We see, you know, this, uh, this crazy story unfolding where David basically had an affair with a married woman, and he brought the man home, the husband, and he was trying to trick the husband to go home so that maybe he wouldn't have to have, like, you know, have to claim this child or whatever, but it didn't work. It didn't work. Uriah was a man of integrity. He's like, I can't go home and hang out with my wife and be with her when I have soldiers out there in the battlefield. And so the story goes that he basically let him hang out, tried to get him drunk, tried to get him to go home that way, didn't work. So he sent him back with a royal letter that was sealed with a king's seal on it. And he said, give this to Joab when you get back to the battlefront. When he opened it up, Joab read it and said, hey, put Uriah in the front line of the most fiercest battle so he gets struck down and killed. Well, sure enough, that happened. The word got back to David and obviously got back to Bathsheba and she mourned and then after her time of mourning, she, he brought her to her house, his house, his palace, and she became his wife. I mean, this is, you, you don't need Harlequins. I mean, good Lord, this is like a Nicholas Sparks movie. It's crazy. Just if you really read what's going on here, like real, this, is, this is a man after God's own heart. Now think of that. See, David, David had gotten his empire into a, a place of content. He, he, see, he used to go out and battle for the Lord. He used to go out and to gain and secure kingdom territory. But now we see him as he sends his armies out to do his fighting. See, David chose to stay home, to lounge around, to take it easy. David was in a place of comfort. His kingdom was in good shape. Actually, it was the best shape it had ever been. It was at the pinnacle of his career. His palace was secure. There was no threat. And he had plenty of money in the bank. See, society teaches us that he was at the place of arrival. That's the place that we need to be at. That it, it, it tries to tell us that most people are, are trying to achieve this level and that it should be our goal in life. But what we learn from this story is this, is that we need to be careful. We need to be careful when we get to this place of comfort. Why? Because the enemy waits and he watches for us to put our guard down and to lose our focus off of God. A lot of us think, oh, we've done our time, and, and now it's time for some relaxation. And, and even in saying that, I'm going to slow down on my serving God. I want to save it for the next generation. Let them take over and run. What I'm talking about today isn't necessarily talking about getting older, but rather when we get to a place in life where we experience the ease of life. When we get to a place in life where we don't have a need and we get comfortable. Now, sure, every one of us in here, there's things that we want. And there might be little things we kind of need, but are we really a people of need? I mean, most of us in here have a car, we have a house, we have a roof over our head, we have heating and air, we have food, uh, we have clothes on our backs, our kids are mostly healthy. So we're not really a people of need. And so we get to a place where if we want something, we just go get it. You want a piece of chocolate cake, you go down to the Walmarts, you buy you a box, you go home, mix it up, make you a cake. You want a steak, you go get a steak, throw it on the grill. You want a new outfit, you go, you go to the mall or shopping at the, at the store and you get you a new set of clothes. You need something from Amazon, it's just a click away. Most of you, it's that one click and buy. So we're not really a people of need and we get to this place where we want something, we just go get it. And we don't really have to confide in God with it. You know, we don't have to talk to God about it. I can say this, that having more than enough can be just as big a struggle spiritually is not enough. Because it's so easy to stray away from God when you're not necessarily needing him in that moment. That's when the enemy attacks. And he releases these giants from within us because we've put our guard down and our heart's not protected. 
See, as for David, he didn't need a thing. He didn't need nothing. David had everything he could ever want, yet he wanted the one thing he couldn't have. He had a giant of desire inside of him. And that giant was lust. David allowed his lust to grow. His lust grew to adultery, and then it grew to deception, and that deception led to death and murder. And from that point on, David's life was never the same. I want to talk about it this morning. I might get a little personal, so here we go. You know me. I'll just go wherever God leads me. Oftentimes, as adults, we can make decisions that in that moment may feel so good. But the reality is that the collateral damage that it can bring can be devastating for generations. See, David spent the night with a married woman. And who knows? Bathsheba may have been do doing that intentionally. She may have been taking a bath at that time to maybe catch his eye. No one knows that for sure. We don't know. But here's what I can say to address that. Ladies, for you, please help us guys out. Listen to me. Men are carnal creatures. Men are visually stimulated. And so I don't want to be the fashion police or anything like that, but give us guys a fighting chance. Listen, if you're going to wear something out in public, ask yourself this. Is this something that I would feel comfortable with if Jesus invited me to lunch? Just being honest. Because what might be cute to you in this modern society we live in where it seems like the less clothes you wear, the cooler you are. What may be cute to you, it may be a real struggle for a man. Now, no one knows Bathsheba's intent. But the one thing we do know is from this short moment of pleasure left a lifetime of turmoil and regret. And maybe that's you. Maybe you're like David. Maybe you've been in that situation, or maybe you're currently in that situation to where, where lust is your giant. Maybe there's someone that you've been around and they, they compliment you more than they should. Man, you're looking good today. <laughs> he said, I look good. Maybe, maybe when you talk to them, y'all are staring in each other's eyes like you're trying to stare into someone else's deep in their soul. Maybe you accidentally brush up against them more than you should and the problem is is your attention is being diverted from your spouse to this person and so I, I want to give you a statistic a few statistics you probably heard of them uh, one of them at least uh, anytime I'm going to officiate a wedding I always get these people together and I always I always set them down I always give them a few statistics to prepare them of what's in what lies in store and here's one I always tell them is 40 to 50 percent of all marriages end in divorce. 40 to 50 percent. For something that was ordained and constructed by God, it fails almost half the time. The common denominator of that failure is us. God didn't make a mistake. 40 to 50 percent of marriages fail, and it doesn't matter if you're a believer or not a believer, it's all the same across the board. That's a big statistic. But here's another statistic. Many of you have never heard this one before. 70% of all marriages in the U.S. are unhappy or dissatisfied with their spouse. Like deep down, past the surface level, past all the filters of life, past all the, the smiling family photos of you standing out in the field with the sunset behind you and all the tall grass, and you got your kids, you're all smiling, past all that, past all the perfect social media posts, Past all the fluff in life, people are unhappy in their marriages and their spouse don't even know it. See, just because you call yourself a Christian and you go to church doesn't mean you're protected from this statistic. But with that being said, there's two things, and it only takes two things that you can do to bulletproof your marriage. The first thing is invest in your spouse. Invest in them. I don't mean buy a bunch of crap and throw it at them. Anybody can throw money at stuff. That's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is talk to them. Now, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to lie. I'm a very honest pastor. Me and Shannon, we, we have a great marriage. I love my wife. She's my best friend. These things are struggles for me. Outside of here, I'm a very quiet person. 
And so there's times where she literally has to pull it out of me. But men and women, we got to talk to our spouses. Talk to them. And then we also got to listen to them. Listen to what they have to say. Have conversations. Go on walks with each other. Go on a walk with your spouse. Spend quality time with your spouse. Quality time isn't at the ball field with your kids. Quality time isn't isn't going to a recital to watch your kids. Spend time with just them. Hold their hands when no one's looking. Hug them when there ain't no cameras around. You know, something me and Shannon just about a year and a half ago we started doing, and it's been so good to us. I actually gave somebody this advice the other day, and it's nothing crazy. Their, their, their spouse was struggling. I said, do this, try this. Me and her, just we, we, we just get to a place to where we have a little free time. We're very busy people, but every now and then we'll have a moment in time. And uh, I told somebody the other day, when, when you work in a church, you don't have days off. You have moments off. And so we had a moment in time, and, and we've been just driving around going for drives and the other day we drove around just about a month ago was the last time we done it but we drove around three hours in mulberry <laughs> like we were i lived here my whole life and we're going down roads like where are we she's driving i don't know let's just keep going and but but we just drive around and we begin to talk, and for me and her, we talk about all of the, the struggles and the needs and the wants and the hurts of our church and, you know, kind of where we need to do better, things we need to work on. And we'll go through all the business aspects of our life together like that. And then it's the same way every time. And then it gets this real awkward silent for about 10 minutes when we're just like listening to the radio or looking out the window, trying to figure out where we're at. But then we'll start talking about us. And we'll start talking about our dreams and our desires and the things that we want to achieve and our kids and our animals. And what happens is we break through all the world and then we begin to refocus on us. Like I said, I, we're no masters at it. We're no professionals at it. But we're trying our very best to invest in one another. If you invest in each other, that's step one of bulletproof in your marriage. And let me tell you, I know some of y'all have been from broken marriages. It takes both partners to do this. Number two, it's easy. Invest in God. Together and individually. Truly put Him first. Build a relationship with Him together and individually. Like, yes, have your private prayer time. Have your time when it's just you and the Father. Have that moment, but also come together as a couple. Pray together. Let me ask you this. When's the last time you prayed with your spouse? If, if when you pray with your spouse, it's awkward or it's weird or it's a little we- different, you're not doing it enough. You should be able to go to that person, grab their hand, and say, hey, let's pray. And there should be no kind of awkwardness whatsoever. Because you have built a life together, not only with one another, but with God in the center of it. So if you can't grab your spouse's hands and pray, you need to work on that. Matter of fact, this morning, I got up at 4 o'clock this morning for some reason. I know, crazy. Just woke up. So I'm in the bathroom trying to get dressed. You know, I'm not like a woman. Every light in the house is on. You know, I, I try to sneak around like some kind of like ninja. And, but I still woke her up when I'm about to leave. I was just going to sneak out. And she rolled over and said, we going to pray? Yep. So I went back around, grabbed her hand, and prayed. Because it's normal. Pray together. Be faithful to the house of the Lord. Go to church. Serve in church. Find your place and serve. Hang out with godly church folks. Listen, build relationships in church with spiritually people, with people who spiritually challenge you. Find people in this building, in this facility, that pull you closer to God instead of push you in the opposite direction. I want to tell you a real quick story, and I'll make it quick. But when I was a young man, right out of school, I took a job. And I was working as a quality tech at this facility. And it was me, just a young guy. And I worked with five middle-aged women in a room. We had an office. And man, the gossip that went around, I was just, I mean, I wasn't really involved because I did not fit into that that demographic. But I would hear everything. And there was this girl, I'm just going to call her Lori. Her name was Lori. True story, true as can be. And Lori was a sweet woman, sweet. Out of all the women, she was so sweet. She always she had a, a husband that loved her. He would always bring her flowers. 
always uh, bring her lunch, and all the other women just swooned over how good of a man he was. She always talked about her kids. She always talked about her church life, always talked about godly things. And these other women, not so much. They were very worldly. They were bar flies, and they just, they just, they just didn't go to church, and they just didn't trust in, in God. And they actually convinced Lori and her husband to go have a drink one night at, at a bar and just hang out and dance, and they, you know, reluctantly went. Now, I got the edge of this story by just being in the office with them. And within two months, that kind of became a habit for them. Two months in, they got propositioned by another man and woman to uh, exchange partners. Just being honest. True story. Within six months of the initial invite, six months later, it was ending in a bitter divorce. This is a woman who had this amazing husband. Wonderful kids and a great church life. But she chose to hang out with people who pulled her away from God instead of pushed her in. So easy it can happen. Maybe your giant isn't lust. Maybe it's something else. Maybe it's anxiety. Maybe some of y'all sitting here today are, are anxious people. Maybe uh, everywhere you go, you're just wound up tight like a, like a, sh- like a shaken bottle of wine. You feel like your, your cork's about to pop. You just, you know, you just, you feel nervous. You feel faint. Your heart races. You just can't seem to overcome it. You break out in sweats. Anxiety has a grip on you. That giant has its foot on your neck, and you just find it hard to breathe. Anxiety. Maybe your giant's anger. Maybe you just struggle with getting angry. I'll be honest, that used to be one of my big ones. I still struggle with it. I still fight that giant. Anger just rises up real quick, and and man, you just just take it out on those closest to you. Maybe maybe you're in here today, and let me just talk to the men. I talk to the women. Maybe you're a man in here, and you just just like to tell you, put your wife in her place. You just like to tell her how it is, because you're so mad because you're a man. You're a man. I'm a man, and I'm mad. And so maybe you take it out on your wife. Verbally. Maybe it goes a step farther and you take it out on them physically. Let me just tell you something real quick. If that's you and you need somebody to punch on, come see me. The problem is I'll punch back. We are men. God gave us women as a helpmate, as a partner. Not to raise fists at, not to raise words at. We are to love them and cherish them and take, watch over them and take care of them. So if that's, your, if that's your giant, let's talk. Let's talk. Maybe your giant's emptiness. Maybe you, you, you just have this empty hole inside of you. There's this void. Deep down you feel it a loss and you try to fill it with material things, but it, it doesn't work. It's just, it's just a band-aid on a giant gaping wound. You just feel empty. Loneliness. You're a lonely person. This giant continually reminds you no one cares about you. And no matter how many tri- people you try to force in your m- life, you force yourself to be around, in your mind there's only a table for one and it's for you. Maybe it's depression. We live in the most depressed time in our modern history. People are walking around depressed and they don't even know why. Like joy and happiness are nowhere to be found unsatisfied is your most common feeling, is it even worth going on? It's what this giant whispers over and over in your mind. Maybe it's the thought of being a failure. In those broken marriages, a lot of times, being a kid's pastor for so long, this is a lot, a lot of what kids have to deal with when they've seen mom and dad break up, not being good enough. You need to continually speak into their life how amazing they are. Because these unreal expectations or maybe past family drama has led them to a point to where you never feel good enough or you feel like it's always your fault. That thought of being a failure. We all have these giants. All these giants have something in common. What is it? They're all lies. They're tricks from the enemy. Now every one of us in in this room, we fight some sort of giant inside of us. That thing that just kind of conquers us every now and then. Each one of us has a different giant that we fight. But the battleground is always the same. It's between your ears. It's in your mind. 
So how do we fight these giants in our mind? The same way that David fought a physical giant named Goliath on the battlefield. What did he do? He said, I come to you in the name of the Lord. See, he truly only had a couple of rocks in his hand when he fought Goliath. But the strength he had was from the Lord inside of his heart. And the mindset, he was focused on the power of the living God. The reality is David brought a spiritual weapon to a physical war. For us, when we're fighting these mind games, these these giants inside of our mind, we need to bring a spiritual weapon to a mental war. As the band comes up here this morning, we begin to close this message. Paul, the Apostle Paul, wrote a letter to the church of Corinth. He was confronting some false apostles who were spreading false doctrine and division, and they were casting these bad thoughts, these bad ideas. They were putting these bad thoughts in people's heads. So anytime these giants rise up in your life, this is a great scripture to remind them of. It's found in 2 Corinthians 10.5, and it says this, Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. In other words, cast out and cast down anything that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. Anything that begins to contradict God, get rid of it. And then it goes on to say, and bringing into captivity. That's like a prisoner. That's like putting something in a cage and and poking it and prodding it with a stick. Whatever that thing is, put it in captivity. Every thought to the obedience to Christ. When those giants rise up, we need to recognize them. We need to put them in their place. And that place is under the ultimate authority of Christ. In other words, we can crush these mental giants when we have the mindset of Christ. In James 4, 7, it says this. It says, submit to God. Give your life to God. Focus on God. Put your mindset on God. And resist the devil. You can conquer those giants by simply changing what you're focusing on from that giant to Jesus. Books and books and audio tapes have been wrote about how to conquer these things, but it's so simple. We just change our focus. We change our mindset and remind that thing I'm not yours, I'm his. You won't defeat me, he's defeated you. You're big, but he's bigger. You're defeated, he's my king. When we begin to do that, the Bible says, and the Bible doesn't lie, that he will flee. If you would stand all over this place this morning, I don't know what you're going through. I don't know where you're at. But I know this, we all have struggles. The Old Testament and even the New Testament is usually stories of men and women who've done great things with God only after they had these massive challenges that they had to overcome. As we see in King David, great leader, awesome man on the battlefield, had some struggles. Joseph had struggles. Daniel had struggles. They all had struggles. What's that tell us? We have struggles. We have these things. God's word says when we focus on him and we push those things it's not easy but we push them away eventually it will get easier and easier and we can conquer those giants so whatever you're struggling with today whatever it is we're going to open up the front of this stage in a minute for prayer give it to God say God I need you to help me conquer this giant in my life help me be the best person I can be, the best Christian I can be, the best child I can be of yours. Help me through this. And I promise you, he will. Maybe you're here today and you got something else going on. The good thing about God, he just, (laughs) he can fix more problems than one at a time. He's the Lord over all. So whatever it is, if you need prayer this morning, we're about to open up this altar. Come and give it to him. 
pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you right now, Lord. God, we're thankful for who you are, God. I'm thankful, God, that I know I have struggles, but Lord, I know that you're greater than those. And Lord, even though sometimes I fall, you pick me up and dust me off and tell me to keep going. Every time I get a little stronger, God, because I know that there's a God behind me that is bigger than anything I'll ever face. So today, Lord, as we open up the front of this stage for prayer, Lord, if there's anybody out there that needs prayer of anything, Lord, I would just pray that they'd just come and lay it before you. And God, let you lead them through it, Lord. God, we love you. We give you all the praise. We thank you for who you are. Thank you for the victory that we can have in this life. In Jesus' name, amen. These altars are open. Are you hurting and broken and overwhelmed by the weight of sin? Jesus is calling. Have you come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is calling.
loves you. Go out of here today and know that those giants can be defeated. Today we're going to go ahead and we're going to pray over our offering this morning. Thank you guys for giving. In the seat back in front of you, there's envelopes you can put your offering in. Text the word give, give online. Thank you for giving. Before we pray over that, I just want to say next week, um, starting a new series, we're going to we're going to jump off of kings for a while. We'll probably come back to it because there's so many kings, but uh, pretty excited about it. And so it's uh, it's one of those for uh, all those people who like what's going on and stuff like that. I think you're going to enjoy it. So be prepared. Be prepared to have conversations after after church. I think it's going to be a good one. So we're excited about that one for next week. Just wanted to share that with you. Let's go ahead and uh, take up our offering this morning. Then we've got a few announcements. Then we'll go to Sunday school. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you, Lord. I thank you for your son. That you had this plan before <laughs> before the fall of mankind. You knew how to take care of things. Nothing catches you off guard. And you sent your son to this earth, Lord, so that we could be redeemed. You gave the ultimate price so that we could have victory. So, Lord, just thank you for that, Lord. And God, today, as we take up our offering, God, I'll just pray as we take up, you know, our giving, Lord, that you would absolutely just, just touch those who give today to help us continue this race, to, have, to fund this thing in the kingdoms where we go out to the world and we come here and we learn more about you, God. God, thank you for those who invest into your kingdom, God. May you just bless both the gift and the giver today. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, guys. All right, guys, have a seat. I've got just a few announcements to go over before we dismiss for Sunday school. Um, I believe that's this Thursday, the 12th, men's breakfast is going to be a drop-in from 6 to 8 a.m. Um, here at this facility. So make sure you come by, have some breakfast, and get some fellowship in before you go to work. Kids on the Rock will be going to Vertical Horizon Saturday the 14th. They're going to be meeting here at the church at 3 o'clock, and it's $10 per child. So make sure that if you've got a kiddo and kids on the Rock, that you get them signed up for this. Ice Cream Social, you heard Pastor Jimmy mention it. It's going to be next Sunday from 5 to 7 over at Silo City. Break out your grandma's homemade ice cream recipe and get that entered in for a contest. It's going to be a lot of fun, so make sure you come out for that. It's going to be some good fellowship. And Fall Fest, October 12th, we need lots of volunteers, and we're going to start collecting candy donations as well. So if you would, um, if you want to volunteer for that, make sure you sign up on the app and bring in some candy for us, because we have a lot of people come through for Fall Fest, that, and everybody likes candy, right? And finally, there's not going to be any service this Wednesday, um, because it's going to be the Crawford County Fair, and we do Gospel Night Wednesday nights at the fairgrounds. So instead of coming here Wednesday night, make sure you come out to the fairgrounds, celebrate, bring some lawn chairs. It's always a good time. And that's all I've got, you guys. Oh, um, if you've been coming to Ridgeline for a while, and you've never toured the facility, and you'd like to check it out, they're going to meet right here at the front of the stage right after service and take you through a quick tour of the building. So you guys are dismissed to Sunday school. Thank you.